Who Mentored You? Welcome back to Who Mentored You? My name is Amelia Auberg, and I am the Director of Communications and External Affairs at Mass Mentoring Partnership. Mass Mentoring Partnership believes that in order for every young person to thrive, they need access to quality mentoring relationships, regardless of who they are or where they live. It is my pleasure to introduce our guest, Jay Cottle. Jay Cottle is an educator, arts administrator, musician, and writer, and is the founder and executive director of Dunamis. He has worked as an arts educator at the Boston Arts Academy, Dorchester Academy, Boston University, Malden Public High School, Reach for the Stars Academy, Bell, and as the Young Civics Leaders Coordinator and Education Specialist at MassVo. As an arts administrator, he has supported the Community Music Center of Boston, BPS Performing Arts Department, and the Berkeley College of Music. Jay's work specializes in designing curriculum and out of school programs using integrated arts techniques and youth development practices to facilitate transformative growth. Jay is a 2019 National Arts Strategies Creative Community Fellow. Please join me in welcoming the esteemed Jay Cottle to Who Mentored You. Jay, how are you? I'm doing well, thank you. Esteem, that's that's a new one. I have to sit with that for a little bit. Yes, please do. I mean, after that intro, I mean, <laughs> I think I think it, it meets the moment for sure. And so um, I'm so happy uh, to, to speak with you and to talk to you. First, I wanna congratulate you um, on being a recent Boston Foundation grant winner. Um, so I, I'd love for you just to talk about that award and um, how it means to be honored in that way. Sure, thank you. Um, you know, Dunamis has, so we as the organization Dunamis were the recipients of that. And, you know, for a while we were just plugging away. Dunamis began as a, a project for me in grad school. Um, it was an assignment and it came up there. And um, over the next few years, I just kept thinking more and more about it. And um, it was actually really hard because I felt like I had designed my dream job while very much not working at my dream job. And so I was just like, okay, when can I do this? Um, and so we began and we plugged away for a long time as volunteers, um, as folks just, uh, we would meet one day a week after work on Wednesdays, sometimes till midnight, just bringing it all together. And the Boston Foundation was really one of the first uh, champions of our work. Uh, they reached out and um, we're lucky that we get to work with them not only as a grantee to further our work, uh, but also as partners. Uh, we work together on the lab grant to kind of expand the work that we're doing with our particular community to support even more artists in the city. So they uh, have about 65 artists and artist collective and artist organizations that they fund through that program. And we get to work with all of them. And so in the span of a couple months, we worked from working with maybe 10 to 15 artists a year to almost a hundred and wow. um, it, it's it been really intense, uh, but it's been really rewarding and it's really been impacting our work on this side because you really get to see in broader strokes how this affects everyone, how this system affects everyone. Um, and we're also beginning to recognize patterns now. So it's been a beautiful partnership and we're very grateful for how they've helped us grow. That's amazing. Well, congratulations again. So, um, you know, when we talk about mentoring at Mass Mentoring Partnership, a mentor is a caring adult uh, that comes alongside the um, life of a young person and, and, and guides them and walks this path um, and this journey with them. So um, as you know, you think about your mentors, tell me and walk me through who mentored you. Yeah, um, I've had a lot of amazing mentors and sometimes I felt really um, lucky and it was lucky with, I know that some people have like a gratitude towards luck and I do, but for me as an educator, when I look at systems and structures and consistency, I go, well, I had that luck. What if someone else did, right? And so I, I'm very aware of the privilege that I've had of having these really great mentors. Um, a lot of them uh, first came through school. Um, so when I was in high school, 
I don't know how this happened. I have a horrible memory. Um, but somehow my headmaster saw something in me and um, we began to work very closely in regards to educational reform and arts advocacy. And I did not know how to function in those spaces. I had never done that before. Um, but there's this really powerful tenet we talk about in education called the, uh, the assumption of competence. And to have someone of her stature kind of believe in me and say, no, you have a voice. Yes, your voice is valid. And I want to hear it and amplify it. Um, it was really important for me in ways that I didn't understand at the time, um, but really grew to appreciate. And then my other mentors came to me through work. Um, a lot of them were my supervisors, so David Ortiz, Colleen Washington, Alyssa Jones. Um, the three of them are also people of color. And it was expansive. So sometimes it was you know, just watching how they would lead their own organization to do that work. At times it was conversations. It was a lot of putting me in my place. Uh, you know, I, I have I had a tongue at that time. I had a brain thinking I knew everything and um, they were quick with the humility. They were quick with um, checking me. But again, you know, it was important because they did not abandon me. They didn't write me off. They didn't say, oh, this kid, right? Uh, they still took the time to value our relationship enough and my potential enough to have those conversations with me and to try to nurture those things. So they've been instrumental in my growth and so much so that as I'm now moving forward in my journey and thinking about what it means to now be a mentor, I'm really just trying to live up to their standard and really think about how can we believe in people? How can we still give them space to be who they are going to be, right? And also not project onto them what we think they should be. How do we give them that room while still holding them accountable, but also helping them see past what they imagine for themselves. So to me, that's the core of mentorship that I'm excited to get into. Absolutely. And so I'm excited to talk about the work that you do in engaging young people, especially through the creative arts. So walk me through it, you know, um, that process, how, um, you know, you uh, bring this world of art to young people. Absolutely. So I grew up as an artist. I went to performing arts high school and I was noticing that one of my favorite days that we had was when we had an actor who was on tour come to speak to the class. And I remember I asked him a question, you're on tour. What do you do with your apartment? And they were like, I sublet it. And I was like, ah. And the reason I loved that so much was because Although I had been learning my artistic skills and growing as an artist, I felt like I hadn't been learning the business, the reality of what it would mean to be an artist on the day to day. And so the idea for Junamis was really about how do we prepare young people and in particular young people of color for what a career in the arts looks like. Particularly when you also have this narrative that if you become an artist, you're gonna starve and that there's like really nothing there for you and then it's hyper competitive. There are aspects of that is, that are true, but there's so much breadth and depth in this community and in this work and in this sector. And so part one is, yes, how do we take these, these, these artists who have grown up with that narrative in their mind, how do we let them shed that, let them believe in themselves, empower them to create their own work and teach them the business skills to move through this sector? And by the same token, we have arts managers or arts administrators. Um, those are the people that are running the organizations, the ones that are raising the funds, right? People don't usually think about that as being an arts job, but it is, and they're the majority of the sector. I remember I was at a show and I looked around and the audience was older and whiter and wealthier than me. And I looked at who ran the theater and they were older and whiter and wealthier. And I looked who was on the stage and I said, I think this is all related. And I think who you have in power reflects the audience that you get and also reflects the pieces that you put up. And so how can we get more people of color there? And it's a compounded issue. Yes, we have to get them into educational institutions to give them the opportunity to learn. But again, if they are raised with the belief that there is nothing for them in this field, then they're not gonna take that step to learn how to be in it and then learn how to become the leaders who can then put more people on stage, who can then fill these audiences with diversity. So through our apprenticeship, which actually launches next week, we're providing hard arts management skills for young people who both need to learn about this field, but two, also need to be able to point to the resume when they're competing with other people to say, I did this job and I got theoretical knowledge and I got hard skills to make them competitive. So that's a little bit of how we are doing that. 
but also making sure that within both of those, for our artists and the arts managers, that we're sitting down and understanding who we're talking to individually. No person, we say, should move through our program the same way because no person is the same as anybody else. So they all get one-on-one -on -one consultations with one steady person throughout their time to make sure that they're getting what they need as individuals to grow into the best version of themselves. That's fantastic. And I believe I learned about um, your work through a colleague. And one of the things that really spoke to me was the actual name of the organization. Can you, you, can you um, talk about how you came to name the organization and what the name means? Yes, I will nerd out for a moment with that. Um, we were learning about philosophy I think my junior year of high school and this concept of dunamis came up and it really resonated with me uh, for years later, so much so that when I was talking about Dynamis's like mission and work in that grad school class, but I hadn't landed on a name, somebody was just like, why not Dynamis? Um, and so I was like, <laughs> it's perfect sense. Uh, but essentially the Greek philosopher Aristotle uses it to talk about potentiality and being able to look at something and recognize not only what it is, but what, what it has the potential to become. And the example that he used was the acorn and the oak tree. And the power is not that there is, you know, an oak tree in somebody, the ability to transform, to change, to be both things, but still be able to grow is where true power is. And so for us, we say that while yes, we typically present that our work is about, you know, providing these skills to people, really the true work is facilitating the shift in an individual where they can go, I only see myself as this acorn, right? I, I don't know much or I'm a product of that environment. I'm never gonna make it, it's too competitive. I don't have the skills to for themselves being able to say, wait a minute, I am great. I have greatness in me, I can be. Because that way, even if we don't offer them everything that they need, their belief in themselves will help them go out and find it, right? And so it's that piece of transformation of that piece of agency um, for them to see in themselves what we're trying to get them to see is really that core work. And that's why Genomis as a title and as part of our mission resonates so deeply. I love that. And I um, am a product of Boston Latin, so I can deeply appreciate the root words yes. um, that uh, of, of the name. So, mm -hmm. so thank you for sharing that. Sure. So I'm curious um, in terms of the adults, the caring adults, that um, are in relationship with creative young people. Um, can you share best practices about the best ways to support a creative young person um, through their art? And it, you know, this is advice that, um, or practices that would be lifted to those who are in relationship with young people who are creative, and then just caring adults that are in community with young people as well. First off is to support them. Um, a lot of young people have, again, these narratives in their mind that they're not good enough, that they don't have it. We find, and this is really sad to us, that so much of our work, we catch ourselves saying, be kind to yourself. Yes, that makes sense. They put a lot of pressure on themselves. And so supporting them and letting them know that they can, whilst also providing accountability. Did you do that thing? Have you written today? Where is that work you said you would have? because um, that's another expression of support. I know you can do it, why is it not here? Um, so definitely finding the balance between that support and um, the accountability. And like I said before, allowing them to be an individual, allowing them to determine for themselves who it is they're trying to be and giving them space to be messy. They're gonna make mistakes. They're going to, to stumble. Um, and what's important is that you stick by them as they go through that process and understand and relate to them also that it is a part of the process. But it's not always linear, it's not always easy, it's never easy. Um, and so it's important to kind of leave that space for messiness. Um, and then the last thing I'd say for everyone involved is to really be uncomfortable in not always knowing the next step. You know, I think some of us have this issue, I'm raising my hand, with vulnerability and with thinking about, well, I don't know what's next. I don't know what it always looks like. I wanted to have a plan. And once I surrendered and said, okay, what's more important than knowing what's gonna happen is making sure that I as an individual have the skills and perspectives I need to survive whatever happens, 
to be resilient in the face of whatever happens, that internal development is more important than controlling the outcome. Because if I make myself able to survive anything, then I'm no longer afraid of the future. I can embrace it. I can see it as a place to experiment. Um, and so really making sure to cultivate that uh, resiliency and um, joy in the work, I think is an, another key part. That's wonderful. Thank you for lifting that up. And so I'm curious just to close in my last question, you talked about who mentored you. Um, so I'm curious now that you are walking as the founder of this great organization and you're the um, executive director, how are you paying it forward to the people that mentored you? I think one thing was actually letting my mentors know the impact they've had on me. Um, I always, I subscribe to that rule of give people their flowers while they're alive. Um, because I also think sometimes you don't know the impact that you have on people. And so it's important for me to do that piece. Um, with this, honestly, I've struggled as, as far as maybe three or four years ago, I was invited to be part of a program and I thought they wanted me, it was like a mentor mentee thing. And I thought they wanted me to mentee and they were like, no, we want you to be a mentor. And I was like, me? And I said, no, at the time I was like, no, hard pass. Um, they don't want to hear from me. Um, and I really had to sit with it because there was this idea that I had to be finished, that I had to be, you know, fully developed in order to then get back. And I think, um, oh, and this, I guess, goes back to that last question, a transparency of, I don't know everything. I'm, I'm sharing my experiences with you in hopes that they resonate with you and make sense. And I have noticed some things along the way, and I'll share that. But it was definitely a shift for me to feel like that's really what it is. I'm sharing a part of my life. Um, but in terms of how I've been doing that, definitely with the programs that I've uh, been able to run and then be adjacent to. Um, and then also helping folks who are trying to build their own organizations and have those questions, being as transparent as possible. I'll share with one little anecdote. There was um, this question that came up a while ago kind of online about if, if you've learned all this stuff and somebody wanted to pick your brain you know, would you just go to coffee with them? Or would you say, I worked really hard to get this knowledge, so you need to pay me for my time, et cetera. I don't really subscribe to that belief. Um, I think when you learn, teach. When you get something, you give something. And so I think just being also open to anybody to ask the questions and say, this is where I get grants from. This is my mailing list. This is where I've learned. Um, really just trying to be not transactional, not be a gatekeeper for knowledge for folks has been really important to me as well because folks have been open and shared those things with me. That's wonderful. And that's a, a great way to end. Jay, thank you so much for your time and for giving your talent and for your contributions to the artistic community here and how you impact the lives of young people. To learn more about mentoring or to be a mentor, please visit us at massmentors.org or follow us on all social media platforms at Mass Mentoring Partnership. To our audience, thank you for watching. Who mentored you? Until next time, 